So that's what the views look like. That's how we get them. And I'm just going to remind you about the five questions. So is the heart beating? Is there pericardial fusion? Is there left ventricular dysfunction? Is the right ventricle dilated? Obvious valvular or aortic root pathology. So that's what we're going to do as we go through some of the findings that we're going to look for in these patients. All right. So now we're going to talk about one of the first things that we looked at, which is pericardial fusion. What does that look like? What's the significance of it? And what are we going to do about it? So here are some examples. Pericardial fusion is going to be fluid wrapping around the heart. Here it is in a parasternal long axis view. Now when someone has a significant pericardial fusion, if they have much pericardial fat pad, you'll see that kind of flopping around in that fluid. And sometimes that throws people off if they haven't seen that before. But this is just their fat pad flopping around the effusion. It doesn't really have any other significance other than to recognize that it's not some other pathologic finding. So here we see circumferential fluid in the parasternal long axis view. Some things we can notice here is the right ventricle is not really filling at all. The left ventricle is kind of compressed. Similar here, large pericardial fusion, fat pad flopping around. Right ventricle is kind of hard to see because it's not filling and the left ventricle itself looks a little bit small. These are some of the findings of tamponade that we're going to talk about. A couple of things to note about pericardial fusions and we'll talk about differentiating them from fat pads because the number one thing that people mistake is a fat pad for pericardial fusion. I'm going to try to help you with that but you'll probably still make that mistake and it's okay as long as you don't stick a needle in their fat pad. With pericardial fusion, you see some fluid. You're generally going to see some in dependent areas. So take a look posterior to the heart. Sometimes that's the only place you're going to see it. And you'll notice as the cardiac cycle happens, there are a lot of shape changes in this fluid. See how the thickness changes and the shape changes? So that's a clue that is actually fluid because the heart is swimming in it. Whereas fat pads, when we look at them, their shape doesn't really change that much throughout the cardiac cycle. The other thing that can fool us is just fluid, whether it's pleural versus pericardial. Pericardial fluid posteriorly will come around the left ventricle and come up in front of the descending thoracic aorta. So look for that fluid to come up here and be anterior to the descending thoracic aorta like it is here. If that fluid comes to the side and down behind the descending aorta, then that's probably pleural fluid that sometimes can mimic pericardial fluid. So that descending thoracic aorta, a very important landmark. So a few examples again. So here we see pericardial fluid. Let's look at this first. See how the shape drastically changes throughout the cardiac cycle. Some of it comes down behind and we can see it anterior to the descending thoracic aorta. So here we see this anterior fat pad. It's mostly anterior. It's got more of a gray appearance than a black appearance like the pericardial fusion. Doesn't wrap circumferentially. And then the right ventricle is nice and wide and filling. So these are all indicators that we're dealing with a fat pad and not an effusion. Most of the time if you're staring at something and you're like oh, I think it might be an effusion but there's no other real indicators. There's a good chance it's probably a fat pad. Please try and recognize fat pad versus pericardial effusion. If it's really small and there's no other clinical effects or effects on the right ventricle, then it's probably not clinically significant anyway. Just another example. So these are all fat pads. So this is gray fat pad. Thickness changes, but there's nothing back here. There's no, at least from this view, there's no effect on the right ventricle. We definitely get some more views to confirm that that's true. Similar here. This is gray. It keeps mostly its shape. The thickness changes a little bit. Right ventricle is filling nicely, doesn't wrap around, so this is just a fat pad. So when you're questioning yourself, is it real or not, most of the time they're probably fat pads. Effusions, we can see here, this is a nice fluid stripe. That's pretty obvious. Shape changes pretty significantly, and if we pay attention back here, we can see a little bit of fluid wrapping posteriorly as well. In this view, there's not as much anteriorly, but the fluid tracks more into the dependent areas. So here we see the pericardial effusion, and we see a thin stripe in between the left atrium and the descending thoracic aorta. So that can help us recognize that this is indeed pericardial fusion. Then always the next question is, is it clinically significant or not? Are there signs of tamponade or not? And we'll talk about that. Another thing I want you to recognize, however, is that pericardial fusions are not always black. Sometimes in the cases of trauma or aortic dissection or maybe a left ventricular wall rupture scenario, you may see hemopericardium. And that stuff can clot pretty quickly and we still need to recognize that. So here's a pretty profound example. So we've got some liquid blood here, but we've also got some clotted blood, and this is in a setting of trauma. So hemopericardium may look like this. And in this one, again, we see some liquid black stuff here, which is the liquid blood, but there's some gray stuff on the edge here, which is hemopericardium as well. So we need to recognize that sometimes the fluid around the heart does not always look black. And there could also be scenarios where there's stranding or other things as well. And in some scenarios, we might even see if someone's had previous surgery, 
surgery or scarring, we may see a focal pericardial effusion such as this, which may only be seen in certain views. So be on the lookout for that kind of thing as well. Maybe the patient has a history of surgery or pericarditis in the past, which could lead to a focal pericardial effusion. This may be difficult to treat at the bedside and may require surgery. All right, so we've talked about pericardial effusion. So now let's talk a little bit about tamponade and how to make the diagnosis and what the findings are going to be. If you're like me, you probably remember in med school and even during residency being kind of taught that tamponade, they either have it or they don't. But what I want to emphasize with this and what echocardiography has taught me is that cardiac tamponade is, one, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's not solely an echocardiographic diagnosis. And cardiac tamponade exists along a spectrum from people with an asymptomatic pericardial effusion. And then as pressure rises, they get into true cardiac tamponade with echocardiographic and clinical findings. Somewhere in between between these, you can start to see some echo findings of tamponade physiology, but they haven't truly edged over into the clinical findings where they're really short of breath or hypotensive or with signs of shock. So it exists along a spectrum. This all is related to the rate of accumulation, the volume, and things like that that we've all been taught since med school. The intravascular volume plays a role as well. And here is kind of a made up but somewhat realistic graph of how pericardial fluid can accumulate and how the pressure rises and how the findings are managed manifest on echocardiography. Way back here, they may have no findings with small pericardial effusions or low pressure effusions. Then you'll see a progression of findings as the pericardial pressure increases and the differential between the pericardial pressure and the right ventricular pressure changes. So first off, we're going to see the stension of the inferior vena cava. Next up, right atrial systolic collapse. We may then next start to see mitral inflow velocity variation. We'll touch on that just a little bit. Right ventricular diastolic collapse, and then eventually they're going to get collapse of the left ventricle as well. These things will change depending on their preload, what's their right ventricular filling pressure in relation to the pericardial pressure. So here are some of the findings. So this is a subcostal long axis view where we've got this view of the inferior vena cava, the middle hepatic vein draining into the inferior vena cava going towards the right atrium. We can see some of the pericardial fluid around that and this inferior vena cava is kind of dilated, distended, and there's no collapsibility whatsoever. So in most scenarios, if you look at the IVC and it's collapsing or kind of flat, they do not have tamponade and that can help you in your decision making. One of the next findings may be collapse of the right atrium and if we're paying attention to the cardiac cycle, this is occurring during systole. You see it's like someone's poking a finger in towards the right atrium during systole here or here in this subcostal view we can see that collapse of the right atrium. Now this is a pretty early finding. Most of the time if you see this, the clinical picture is not going to look too severe. This could progress quickly and we should keep a close eye on people with these findings. Next, we're gonna see right ventricular collapse. And what I'll usually ask myself is, how well is the right ventricle filling? Even with small effusions, we might see some little dips in the right ventricle that are probably insignificant, but if the right ventricle is not able to fill, that's gonna be concerning and that patient's gonna get into trouble pretty quickly. So here we can see this is a subcostal view. We've got a large pericardial effusion. We can see the right atrium here, but the right ventricle itself really isn't filling much at all. And so this is a person who's getting into trouble pretty quickly and probably a candidate for a bedside pericardiocentesis. Same thing here, we've got a huge pericardial effusion and the right ventricle, we can see it filling a little bit, but it's definitely dipping, but also the left ventricle is small. Same over here, left ventricle is small. So these are both patients who have echocardiographic evidence of tamponade and if the clinical picture fits, these are people that should have a bedside pericardiocentesis. I wouldn't transfer them. I wouldn't wait. I would certainly try to maximize their intravascular volume. These fluid collections cannot stay. they got to go. What I'll ask myself is how is the right ventricle filling? Because even with small effusions, sometimes we'll see these little tiny insignificant dips in the right ventricle, but it's still filling well. Like we saw in the previous views, these are even more profound. We've got large pericardial effusions. The right ventricle barely can see it because it's not filling at all. But the left ventricle is also getting collapsed because of the high pressures and because preload is just cut down significantly. So these are patients who, if they don't look like they're in shock already, they're going to be in shock soon. And also candidates for bedside drainage, I would minimize any delay and get this done as soon as possible. They could crash on you quickly. Just another profound example of such severe pericardial tamponade where we see both of the atria, but the ventricles almost are unrecognizable here because they're completely compressed. This needs drained emergently. I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this because I 
think from a practicality standpoint, I'm not sure what the true clinical relevance of this is, but if we get an apical four chamber view and we use Doppler to evaluate the inflow velocities to the mitral valve and we see significant variation, more than 25% with respiration, that can be another indicator of tamponade physiology. Most of the time, I think if you're not the cardiologist and you're the point of care user at the bedside in the hospital or the ICU or the emergency department, if it's not clear to you that it's tamponade from other findings, then it can probably wait. This is an interesting finding. It's physiologically interesting, but if the rest of the clinical picture hasn't convinced you that it's tamponade, I'm not sure doing this is going to change your immediate bedside care. You may be asking for consultative help at this point. But here's just a nice quick graphic representing the findings from colleague Dr. Ben C. Smith or at Ultrasound Jelly does a great blog post called Ultrasound of the Week. Now they've switched into core ultrasound, so check them out. And that brings us back to one of our cases that we talked about earlier. Some of these young folks, they can compensate until things go poorly. And this is a diagnosis that you know, the EKG findings may not be there. It may not be classic. The only way you're going to find these things is to echo these patients and have a high suspicion. So this patient, 19-year-old, shortness of breath, CPAC, we see these findings. This needs to be drained. Even though the patient may look pretty well, their right ventricle is not filling at all. It's a large effusion. This is the etiology of their shortness of breath. It had already been missed at a couple of visits. Hopefully you can avoid missing it now with bedside ultrasound skills.